So a little more about the data, because this is we're actually going to work with the data today. So it comes from um, this recently published work from uh, Tom Pond's group, looking at monocyte transcriptional responses in uh, response to MTV infection. And so just for those who um, aren't familiar with this area of research, these are some acronyms and sort of details that appear in the notes that you might not be familiar with. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, often called MTB in the notes, is what the causative agent of tuberculosis, often called TB. So TB is among the top infectious disease killers um, worldwide and has been for a really long time. We've been co-evolving with it for a really long time. And it predominantly infects lung macrophages, which is why this data set we have monocytes, which are you know, the higher class of that. So exposure to the TB um, leads to infection, or you could clear it, or you could contain it. So there's lots of different phenotypes. And um, one of our cohorts, we have this sort of really cool resistor phenotype, which is where this data set comes from, looking at if you naturally can clear TB, where a lot of people can't, how are you doing that? How are your monocytes and macrophages accomplishing that? And so that's where the mechanism is unknown. But these data were a step towards that. For those in the lab who really wanted more details, um, this is exactly where the data came from. So there was whole blood, um, not collected from the resistors in this case, but for our control group, those latently infected with tuberculosis. CD14 monocytes um, were enriched, then it was in, they were infected or not with TB for six hours. We did both RNA filtering and did you know, quality control of those sequence files aligned to the genome and then counts. So really the data we're gonna be working with today are those counts and if you, want to know the pipeline to go from raw fast view to counts table, um, there's a link in the notes that also shows you our entire software to do that. Um, but we're starting right from for every gene and every sample, we have a number that says how many times that counts appeared, or how many times that sequence appeared. So abundance, basically. So with that, I'm going to get the notes link on the top panel. Exactly the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I got to it eventually. Okay. So uh, for those in intro who are in intro R, you can just open your intro R project and use that. So you find that dot R project file inside of your project directory. Double click that. It opens you up into where you were working before. Uh, for those who weren't, we're going to make a new project uh, so that everyone's on the same page. So I'm going to open up my R Studio. You can see I was working on a bunch of stuff. So that shouldn't open for you. You're not working on Incipit TV GWAS with the workshop. So should open into a blank R Studio. And um, we're going to create a new project. So file new project. Good reminder for those from, from intro, that's how you do it. I'm going to create a new directory, project. You can call it whatever you want. It's going to call these IDR short. Close our studio and reopen. And we can tell we're in a project because in the corner it has our project name. Fast project that was intro R earlier in the week. Now we have Petty R. For those in intro R, it doesn't matter that our projects are named something different. Doesn't change anything. This changes what the folder name is on your computer. You see, I've made my IDR folder here. Wherever you downloaded the data, you then want to take it and put it inside of your projects. So inside of your project, have a folder called data, and inside of there, you'll have this dat zoom object, which we'll talk about more. Um, schema results, so you don't have to run linear, linear models that take forever. And then that metadata, which we used in intro R today as well. Can uh, everyone on Zoom give a green check mark or a green post it when you have your project set up with your data folder? Another, I know that was a lot of clicking.
if you have uh, errors or anything, please throw up the red X so I know not to move on versus if you're just still working on it, you don't have to work on yet. So pretty much everyone, um, if you're still working on it, okay, I'm going to talk for a bit more about things. So if you want to, everyone want to clear their, their uh, chart mark so that when we ask the next question, it doesn't say you already responded. So inside of our project, we're going to start a new script. So those with the intro, our project will also do this. So new file to our script. Immediately, I always save it. And it'll save in your project directory. And this is the script that I will post on GitHub after wherever you see examples in there. So because we've opened a new R session um, and a new R script for that matter, uh, we don't have any of our packages yet. So we, were, we downloaded Tidyverse, but we can't access any of it. Uh, so we have to every single time we load our packages. This is my actual working profile, but everything is dark and small, which is a little bit bigger. We're going to load packages. And that's the library function. As a reminder, you can run code from anywhere. Your pointer can be in the center. It can be at the end or the start. You can click run, or you can click command enter or, or control enter to get things to run. We get this message about what we're loading with the Tidyverse. The Tidyverse is actually a suite of many different packages, even more than are listed here, which is why it takes a while to download. So it's telling us not only that we have this version of the Tidyverse, but the actual things we're working with in the packages we're going to call fun functions from, like GDBot2 tomorrow and we play our today, here are all the versions. We have some conflicts, which just mean that there are multiple functions currently in R that have the same name. So it's a little bit of a recap from intro, but a reminder for those who are uh, just joining today. If we want to call a function and specifically tell R which package it comes from, we're going to do that with the package name and the double colon. So for example, here, because we've loaded tidyverse, if we say filter, it's going to assume we want these by R because we've chosen to load that package. But if for some reason we wanted the stats one, which is a base R package, we just use stat double colon filter to tell R, no, no, I don't want the one that you think I want by default. I want this other one. Um, and because we've loaded the package, that's going to take precedence. Like I said, we, we made the choice, made the extra effort to load this. So it's going to assume you want the functions from here. If you get anything other than this message, uh, like if you get error, it means it's not installed correctly. So try reinstalling. Um, if you get us any sort of warning that says like this package was built on X version of R and you're running whatever version of R, that should be fine. You know, if it said version like three and then you know 3.0 and you're running 4.0, that would be a problem. Um, but usually it's you know 0 0.01 different and then a the small enough version differences that it's not going to be a problem in this case. Particularly those who are new, you just downloaded R, and so it'll be the latest version anyway. So our next step is to load our data. So we're going to call it meta, just this is the same as what we did in intro, um, only instead of doing read.table or read.csv, we <laughs> use the underscore version. So we see read r here is a package from the tidyverse. And so read underscore csv instead of read period csv, very, very similar functions. Uh, we go to the help page, for example. We see it's you know reading delimited files. There's also a read delim, which is like read table. There's CSV, there's TSV one. Um, and the reason we're using these is they're in the tidyverse. You can certainly use the base R period one and do all the formatting. But the way tidyverse works is in what are called tibbles, 
which are a type of data frame. And there's really, in terms of you working with them, there's no difference, it doesn't matter. But under the hood, it just has some nice formatting that like when you ask it to print a table in your document, it's only gonna show the first 10 rows. So if you have like a thousand row table, it's not gonna print the whole thing when you ask for a preview as opposed to base R, which is like, you want the table, here's the whole table. It's like, no, no, too big. Um, as well as we'll see when we load something, it automatically gives us some information that the base R reads CSV does. We're going to give it our file quotations to tell it that it's you know, something outside of R. We have our data folder and then the metadata. That complete So when I run that, we see quite a bit more messaging than we got with intro. So we see. It basically gives us the structure to start off. So it tells us how many rows and columns, and then it tells you your data types, which we did a lot of class and then looking for the data type before. So this just automatically lists them all and nicely in short form. So all five of these variables are characters. These two variables are double, which came up of, that means double precision numbers. It's just a numeric with lots of decimal places potentially. And then LGL is logical. So it goes true falses. Um, it gives you these, this is a new option. So just these little eyes just mean, here's information for you. It's not an error, it's not a warning. It's just here, something you might find helpful. So it's saying, you know, you can use spec specifications to get even more information, or you can say show column types to false to make this message combined. So like the first time you load your data, this is helpful. And then when you reload it for like the eighth time, you're like, yes, I know, please. Um, so you could set, show this to false, and then it'll be nice and silent. But we like to see it and I always when I print documents like this to be the first thing to come up so that people who are new to the data know what sort of data we're looking at. If we look at what sort of data meta is, this is where that slight difference with the underscore from uh, read R in the tidyverse versus our base R read from before, we see that it is still a data frame, but now we have these extra TBL for Tibble. Again, actual working you don't have to care about this, it doesn't matter, but just under the hood, it's nice to know. <laughs> so if we actually if we look at it, so view the capital V, which I often forget, meta. Um, and also as a note for those who are like quoting along, if I'm in a different screen, the most recent thing will be printed down here too. So don't feel like you have to wait for me to go back to my script to see what I wrote. Okay. So this looks exactly the same, like if it's a table technically, but it's just a table with all of these data. As a kind of review, an overview of data of what we have here. So we have a library ID. So this is just a unique ID for the sequencing library. It is just a combination of enough other variables to make it unique. We have a de-identified patient ID, just one to 10. Um, skipping some, we have conditions. So this is that from the experimental design, whether it's the media control or infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, age of the participant in days, their biological sex, this old sort of patient ID with a bunch of leading zeros. So if we had, you know, a thousand patients, this would still sort correctly because it has all the leading zeros. True and false about whether we have RNA-seq data, which those are the data we're working with today. So those are all true as well as whether the same sample that we have methylation data. This is actually a cohort we've studied extensively. Um, so these aren't important in the sense that we're gonna use the methylation data, they're just a nice example of logical uh, variables. Then we have the total sequences, so just numeric, how many sequences. Um, if I click on this, you know, we can sort it and we see we have anywhere from like 15 million decimals are hard to see on here to like six million. So there's a lot of data from these, uh, arguably over sequenced, there's a lot. Just some summary uh, data for these to help us learn the tidy birds. Um, so just so I'm understanding, so we kind of have two data files we're working with. One is called meta, which is this, which is really just a description of the samples, right? So the meta. Yeah. You open it in Excel. Like, files right? where the actual sequencing counts and everything. Goes. Yes. So the other file includes is like that complex data file with this as part of it plus the counts. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. haven't seen the counts yet. Got it. So those are our data. So now we're going to start doing stuff to the data. 
So in terms of working with the tidyverse, one nice thing about being in the meta package is you don't have to remember which function was in vFire, which function was in Radar, which you just, since you've loaded the whole tidyverse, you can just use them. Um, I will make notes just so you know, but it's very, very rare that I have to write dplyr colon colon because it knows what I want. So everything we're going to be doing right now is technically in the dplyr package, which we can do help pages for full packages. This is just grammar of data manipulation. Um, dplyr is not even an acronym for anything, but. So the first sorts of things, so there's lots of things we want to do to data. So these are just examples of things we can do. Um, in all honesty, this data table is already pretty dang tidy. Um, but these are the sort of functions that if we got a not so tidy metadata table from a collaborator, as we always do, uh, ways you can make it tidy and easier to use. So the first sort of thing is to select. So we'll select a specific column. And like anything in R, the Syntax is our function, parentheses, and then a bunch of parentheses. Also, page for this side. I should help page is not the most powerful. It doesn't have words that I wanted. So you see, when you have a function, right? If you hit tab, it shows you the parameters. Um, in the case of something like select, it doesn't really have that many parameter options um, because it thinks it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so I will write them out. But so first, always in tidyverse, you give it the data. What is it going to select from? So we give it meta. Um, I could say dot data equals meta. But as I mentioned in intro, the first thing in a function is almost always the data or a file name. So I tend to just not write file equals or data equals because it's assumed. Uh, that's my choice. You certainly can start using all the parameter names or delete all of them. So for select, then the reason there aren't really, there aren't any, you know, options, it just says dot, 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 it's really not very helpful, um, is because there aren't parameters. You just tell it what you want to select. So if we want to select a column, you know, the patient ID column, we just tell it patient ID. And so when we run that, you see we get just that one column. We see here it's still in this table format, but again, just the data frame, basically. For tidyverse, by and large, it tries to have you avoid using quotation marks and back ticks, double and single quotation. It tries to avoid that. So you'll see that here that there is no quotations around anything because all of these are parts of the data. So with tidyverse, it's usually that if it's part of your R environment, so meta is in our environment here or it's inside of your data. So the application ID is a column in our data. You don't need them. We'll see some cases where you do end up needing them, uh, but by and large, tidyverse, no quotations. And if there are, quite honestly, sometimes I forget and then just try like, oh, maybe a quotation will make this work. Oh, maybe a back tick will make this work because uh, it's rare. We can just keep selecting multiple things if we want. So I give it our data. And again, this is why it doesn't list a bunch of parameters in the help page because it doesn't know your column names. So if we wanted our patient ID and our total sequences, we just keep comma separating listing them. And so now it gives us our two columns. Sometimes you have 50 columns and only want to delete one, right? And you don't want to write 49 column names. That would be horrible. So there's a shortcut where we can subtract out the column. So we do select meta. Now, instead of giving the column we want, we say minus the column we don't want. So something we probably don't want is this old patient ID. When we run that, um, it's kind of hard to see. See if I can get it wide enough. That we go into here, old patient ID is between sex and RNA-seq, and we see it doesn't exist anymore. Just go to sex RNA-seq in that column is no longer in there. So that's like, um, you can subtract multiple columns, I guess I should say as well. So we could select meta, um, you could say minus patient ID old, and then minus sex, and then minus you know, all that, or, 
you can use a vector. So C is for concatenate. And I could just say, I don't want patient ID old, and I don't want the sex column. And that would be no longer that sex column. So that just, in this case, is not actually any shorter, right? Saying two minus signs is two characters. Having to do the concatenate actually is more characters. It's actually hurting you. But when you want to subtract like five or six columns, this is a little bit shorter. Um, it's also a little easier to read because your brain just goes minus, oh, minus all of these things. Instead of reading minus this, minus this, minus this, and having to remember, okay, each time minus happens. Um, either work, so it is the same as this. Um, and it's just a syntax choice. So those are the same. Um, and I will add more notes to this before I post it. So if a lot of the little things I'm saying are going to be a little tired. This is how you subtract. This is the same. So the next sort of dplyr function that gets used a ton is filter uh, rows. So this is. Um, some sort of terminology that getting used to in the tinyverse. Like for example, I used to say, so just in my own syntax, I said select for everything. Oh, I select rows and I select columns. If you work in the tinyverse, you probably get used to saying then filter rows because then it reminds you what the function name is. Um, so if you find it hard to remember which is which, uh, then it's basically just a memorization. If anyone knows like a cute mnemonic or something to remember, like filter is rows, select is column, I will 100% take it. It took me months to remember that. Um, and I will Google it after and post if I can find one. But filter is for rows then. Again, all the syntax is just filter. And then we give it our data. And then we have to tell it what we want to filter. So in this case, we can't just say a row name. Tidyverse actually, by and large, avoids row names. Um, the grammar of graphics, uh, the grammar of data manipulation that it's based on um, has one of its tenets is that row names are bad because uh, the row names aren't inside of your data. They're hidden. So the idea is that all of your data should be inside the data frame. Therefore, there are no row names. Therefore, you can't filter by them. So instead, if we remember from intro R, when you make a logical vector and say, is total seeks greater than 10 million? And then it says true and false for every single row, exactly the same here. Only instead of having to save that vector, we just put the statement. In this case, the example, and we'll do the condition because we have MTB media. So this one gets easier to see the output. We're going to only take the media samples. So what filter is doing is it's doing the same thing as base R where it goes, it makes a logical vector for every single row saying, is this statement true or false? And then it's keeping the rows where it is true. As a reminder, double equals is used here to ask R is this equal? Because inside of a function, single equals is telling it it is equal to versus this is asked for. We use quotation um, because this is a character type of data. Um, if we left off quotations, it would be looking for something in our environment called media that does not exist. We're telling it that it is equal to the word media, the character. So we run this, you see we just get all of the media samples. So this would be accomplished as an example in BASAR. It's the same thing as saying that the meta condition, if you don't have to run this and see what this for notes, is equal to media. And again, rows, comma, columns. For, so this is exactly the same thing. Beauty of the tidyverse is that this is a little easier to read. Um, in the end, we're going to make these long statements in the tidyverse, where you can kind of just read them like, I select these columns, I filter these rows, I arrange by this. It's like you can kind of read it as a kind of sentence, um, as opposed to square brackets, parentheses, commas, semicolons, what's happening? Because um, this gets very complicated very quickly. Similar to select, we can ask multiple things. So we can filter our metadata and say we want condition equal media and condition the failed example, but oh. So if we were to ask, I want uh, for every row where the condition is equal to media and it's equal to MTV, that can't happen. 
Um, but nicely, actually, Tidyverse doesn't throw an error. It just gives you a table with zero rows. So this is nice in a workflow of data cleaning of this doesn't break your script. It just means when you get your output, it's blank. And then you can quadruple check that it's blank for real and it's not an error. But also just know, oh, I can't use these filtering parameters because I get nothing. This is very much in contrast to say if I copy this exact and say or instead. So I want every row where its condition is either equal to media or MTB. These are the only two options. So, you know, I get the whole table again, all 20 rows. And you can start stringing together many statements. Um, another syntax choice is often people will do two filter functions in a row because then they can add nice comments like I'm filtering out for quality data and then they do a couple filters. And then the next step is still a filter. So it could have been part of the last line, but it's like a different purpose. Now I'm filtering out like outlier samples or what have you. Um, so you can use these multiple times. I tend to shove everything into one filter statement. Other people tend to separate them. In terms of speed, it doesn't really matter. So the next function, these are just kind of examples of a bunch of useful functions, is rename. Sometimes your variable names are not ideal, honestly, most of the time. So here, this is, like I said, a tidy data frame already. These are the actual variable names we use in the data set, um, which I'm usually very aggressive about naming. So there's nothing really to rename, but as an example, um, that actually somebody else pointed out is a good one. So we have condition, right, which that, it's pretty vague, so we're going to change it to infection because that's actually what it is. Is it infected with MPD uh, or is it not? So, genre, function, data that we're going to do something to. And then the syntax for this is always new name equals old name. So, our new name, we want it to be infection equals our old name, which is condition. We are not asking it if it's equal to, so there's only one equal sign, right? It's just, this is equal to this. I'm telling you, go do this. So only one equal sign. We don't need, again, rotations because these are variable names. Run this. You can scroll all the way up. I cut off, but this is now called infection. Are there any questions or errors? Can I get a green post it when we're good and a green check? There we go. It took a second. Um, I had a question about the filtering by rows. Uh, is there a way to filter not on like the row equal and exactly media? Like if you had media day one, media day three, et cetera, could you filter by the row containing? media in the condition column. Yes. Okay, let's just do that as it. So it's like a kind of an advanced sort of filter, but let's do that. So um, I don't know how well the mics pick up. So the question is, could you, if you didn't have exactly equal to media, um, media one, media two, if there's an uppercase and a lowercase media, I love that. Uh, can you do that? And so you can. So we're gonna filter metadata. And now instead of saying exactly equal, we're gonna use this function called REPL. So what REPL does is it's a pattern matcher, which is super useful. I use REPL pretty much constantly. Um, so now instead of writing an equal to statement, we use the function REPL. So now we're getting some nested parentheses and say, I want to rep find media inside of condition. So now if there was a media one, media two, media three, it would keep any time where the word media was in condition. And as a note, uh, regular expressions, right X expressions are what these are. So we're not gonna go over it, but there are ways to say it has to start with media, it has to end with media, it can be upper or lower case, it has to have numbers or letters. So there are regular expressions to exactly pattern match the most complicated things. Yes. Um, yep. 
Yeah, Elizabeth, you want to ask if you don't want to be on the recording, I can also pause it. Oh, that's okay. Um, can you explain again when you need the quotations versus when you don't need the quotation marks? Yeah, so in general, it's not a hard and fast rule. There are, there's always the exceptions, but in general, if it's data inside of your environment, so if it's, it's called, they're called objects, if it's an object name in here in your data, you don't need them. Or if it's like variable names or parts of your data. So when we had that, we we'll have this list option um, later where there's multiple data frames together that are named. The names of those aren't in quotations. The names of these variables aren't in quotations. Numbers aren't in quotations. Um, you generally in tidyverse only use quotations when you literally want it to look for a word. So like the fact that media is not a variable name, it's literally five characters strung together. Okay. Like I said, I mess this up sometimes and have to just like randomly throw in quotations to try to get it to work when there's exceptions. It's not that okay, nice. and that's just in tidyverse, right? Yes, base R generally follows something similar. So objects in your environment don't have it, um, but variable names sometimes do for different functions. Okay, thank you. Mostly checks. Are there any other questions? Okay. So now we're going to work with a function that is one of uh, one of my actual favorites because uh, it saves me a bunch of stuff I used to do in Excel, um, and it summarizes, which takes both spellings totally fine. So what summarize is going to do is, again, like reading a statement, it's going to summarize your data in some way. So um, I lived in Canada for a while and picked up the S usage somehow. Uh, either works, though. So in meta, what do we what do we want to do? And similar to filter, where we gave it either a function or a statement, that's what we're going to do. And say, I want the mean of age dates. So mean is a function. And then I want to apply to the age days column. When I run that, it gives me what was the mean age of all of my data. It automatically names the variable. So this is another table, uh, tipple, uh, something not beautiful. So if I copy this, you can, in the original sort of thing, you can just tell it mean age. Uh, you can give it a new name. The reason I like this so much is because you can do multiple things. So let's say I also want the standard deviation of age. You can list as many summary statistics as you want, uh, and they can get very complicated. So in this case, just asking for two, we're going to get our two new column names. Now, in this case, we're getting the age actually across duplicate samples, right? We have a media and an MTV infected sample for each person. So this would actually be a bad line of code if we had any samples that were missing its partner. If we only had a media sample for somebody, that means their age is only getting counted once. Um, so age and days would be wrong. That's a dispute. And so one way we can get around that is to group by. So we can say within each condition, tell me what the median age uh, days is. That's another uh, function. So set the group by. Group by itself doesn't, it changes like that hidden part of the data frame that you don't actually look at. Um, but when you look at the data frame, it looks exactly sort of the same. So we have meta, we got a groups, assign it. So we're going to group by our meta table and we're going to group by the condition variable. We're going to save it to our environment because we have to then, after that, summarize. So we have to do two things at once or two things in a row. And so if we didn't save it, we're just printing everything to the console, right? You can't group by and then summarize it because the group by part was just printed and updated. Yeah. If 
great questions was the idea we changed infections we never saved that um we haven't saved anything like wild west over here so if we go to the table it still says condition but yes if you had renamed you would then have to use the correct variable name if you had saved it as anything oh yeah. everything is we're just and say for names there yeah assignments yeah just that they are um, we could overwrite meta in this case. We could just take meta and create overwrite it with a new meta. Uh, I tend to avoid that because then it means that if I wanted to undo this, I'd have to go all the way back to the start and reload my data. So I tend to, again, this is like a choice. Uh, my environment tends to be littered with like 50 data frames <laughs> that are slightly different named um, when I'm working through a workflow. And then when it's done and beautiful, then I'll start just overwriting everything. Uh, but in testing, in this case, we can go back to meta we can save this as a new one. As we look, it's exactly the same. Uh, it's technically different though. You can, uh, you have to trust me. It's technically different. Um, it now knows that it's a grouped data frame. But again, in terms of you actually working with it, you don't have to. Then we would summarize our meta group. Let's just do the mean. So now within each condition, we get that mean. And again, you can start listing multiple summary variables and then you do that. So we've reached the point that now we're having to make a new data frame and write it to the, our data um, environment and then modify it further. We've done many things and just more like infection got lost because we didn't save it. And so there's this amazing ability for tidyverse to use what are called types that types, which is this symbol uh, in R, uh, there's or this symbol. Um, there's the new pipe that I have not switched to yet, it works the same. And so what pipes do is allow you to string together multiple functions without go like without either overriding meta again and again and again as you change it or without renaming it multiple times. And so what a pipe does, so this, this is one of those uh, math things. If you are used to math notation, this is super helpful. If you're not, ignore it because it'll be worse. And I'll do the how I think about it next. Um, so really what this is doing is taking a function, so two functions, f and g, typing them together is the same as doing So what does that mean if you're not used to math notation? It literally means that whatever the output of f is, the first function, it's not saving that if anywhere. It's like in RAM, that's on temporary memory. Whatever the output is, it's gonna immediately just put that into the next function, g. So the way I like to think about it is with actual tidyverse um, functions. It's taking, so if we like root by, the same thing as again, meta, condition and then pipe into our summary, which I should just call <laughs> pipe. What it's doing typos, is it's taking the output of this and sticking it here so that you can use a you don't need the period. This is just like a placeholder. It's saving whatever this output was temporarily and then using it like you put meta here. So the same as actually do it, taking this, just putting it in there. But the reason we use them is because this is a lot more readable. This is what starts to get you to be able to read down the left side and say, I group by, then I summarize, then I filter, then I select, and all these things. As opposed to this is already two functions in a row. 
uh, that get a bit lost and are kind of hard to read. Uh, imagine if you had like six, mm -hmm. seven, or when you get to ggplot, we'll have like 15 lines of code uh, typed uh, in pipes together. Mm -hmm. can get to be a lot. So in practice, this runs the same. It can be on, I like hard returns after any type. It makes it easier to read. You do not have to. This can be on all one line of code, or you can start splitting up on multiple lines as you see fit. And as long as the line ends in a pipe, there's at least one line that ends in the pipe. Um, so. so I think the easiest way to use to learn pipes is to use them. Um, it's not intuitive always. Um, and if you're not, if you don't like them and then you're starting out in tidyverse, mm -hmm. it is perfectly okay to have, you know, six lines of code that are like meta, do something to it, save it as meta, meta, do something to it, save it as meta over and over. Mm -hmm. And then maybe challenge yourself when you have those six lines to say, okay, I know what this output should look like mm -hmm. when you try to pipe them together. And really in doing that, you just delete meta from the start of all your functions mm -hmm. and add the pipe to the end of them is really the only change. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. If pipes are a bit weird and we're going to use them a bunch more, I'm going to ask more questions. More examples. So we're going to add another function and then use the pipe with it. So mutate new variables. So this function uh, creates new variables. And in this case, you know, summarize also technically created new variables. But the idea of mutate is you don't want to get one summary number for all your data or a subset of your data. You want a new number for every single row. And so to do that, we're going to mutate and then we'll show the pipe version. Meta, we want, uh, so Asian days, kind of hard to know what that means, right? So we're gonna do age and years, it's our new variable. And then we're gonna how do you calculate that? Asian days, and a leap year. So you can put any math statement in here and use any number of variables. It's also the cool thing about mutate is once you create this, you can then use it uh, again and again. Here's one you can save it. There we go. So it's created this new variable, which, spoilers, age years was the original variable, and I created age days so that we could do this, <laughs> which is why these are all exactly, exactly even, because we actually, we only actually know the years. We don't know the age, the age to the day. So then I said, with a pipe, well, how would we do this? Meta, so we take our data, don't do anything to it yet, because it's only one function, pipe it into our mutate function is exactly the same thing. Bing. So this is sort of, you know, this isn't saving you any lines of code at this point. Uh, but what it does is sets you up with now, if you had six, seven different things that you're doing to this data, you know, you can read it, meta. Okay, we're going to mutate it. We're going to select it, we're going to filter it, and do all of those things. So, any questions, particularly, I know on the pipe, um, or wanting more examples of it? Check. Um, mine's still not like doing the like it won't change the age and days to the age and years. Like I still see it age and year or sorry age and days, and like it still hasn't changed the. the you mean up here, if like you look at it, it hasn't changed. Yeah. So yeah, we still haven't saved it. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so you're right. So we'd have to save it as meta, which will overwrite meta, and then now it appears. 
well, less not saving any revenue. Okay, cool. Thank you. Without an assignment, you're just printing to this console. It's lost for all time after that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Tidyverse, uh, or not Tidyverse, but, um, our studio can be helpful and then it gives you warnings, so like X's or um, the orange triangles. So that's letting you know there's something wrong on that line of code. Um, and ask, the argument is probably it's missing. Um, so this can be helpful if you don't know what's going wrong. This is telling me unexpected. It's because there's too many. Okay, so then um, if you go, go to the notes. Uh, there are exercises. So the plan now is to break for about 15 minutes um, to both take a break, walk around, get some water, go to the bathroom, do all you need to, as well as tackle one or more of these questions, and then we come back and go over them. Um, so I will just make it easy, easier, more like 20 minutes. So let's come back at 2.15, and whenever you're back and or done with all the questions, you can screen post it or screen check mark. Um, and I will be here the whole time for questions, Sarah. And I will pause for the time. So now we're going to move on to technically another package in the tidyverse. Like if you don't have to really care which package these things came from because they all work together. Um, but we are now going to move into tidy R. Which Tidy R um, is tidying of messy data. Really, with DeepLiR and Tidy R, they kind of have like the same goals. Um, but Tidy R very often has things that react and do things to the entire data frame. And then DeepLiR is individual columns and rows. That's not always true. That's just how I like to remember them. But again, when you're working in the Tidyverse, you don't have to remember where it came from. You just have to remember the function name. So the most useful thing from TidyR I found is it's called pivoting. So if we look at our metadata, um, this is roughly long format. So meaning that each sample has its own row and then each um, column is a new piece of data about that sample. It could be even longer in the sense that you could have literally only one column. Uh, you could have you know, your library ID and then the name of every single variable, and then the third column being the value of every single variable. So this is generally mostly long and pretty tidy. Then there's wide, which is very often people see wide formatted data for uh, time series. So you might have like your measurement on date one is in one column, your measurement on date two is in another column. But when you work with those data, maybe you want them all in the same column so you can take the mean and things like that, as opposed to the mean of two different columns, which requires more code. We can't use root by on that. So we're going to take this uh, data frame and make it wider. So, but fewer rows, more columns. So to widen. So this function, uh, they're called pivots. So it's pivot longer and pivot wider. And again, we give it our metadata. And then there are quite a few options. Um, a lot of them have to do with when your exact variable names don't match or your levels aren't unique. So in general, they're to fix errors. So assuming no errors, really the ones you need to work with are names from. So you're really telling it, Okay, if I'm going wider, that means I'm creating new columns. Where should the names of those columns come from? So in our case, we're going to take the media and MTB samples and give them each their own columns, as opposed to two rows for the same patient. So our names are going to come from condition. 
And then how do we fill in the data? We have these two new columns. Where are the values coming from? So where did the values come from? We look at our data. Most of these are repeated, right? It's like, so each person um, has two samples and their age is the same because they're the same person, their sex is the same. Um, whether we have the RNA-seq data um, or methylation data, same. So really the only thing that differs, and this is by design in this data frame between our two samples from the same person is how many sequences that sample has. So we would wanna make two new columns for total seeks for each for media and MTB. So we tell it we want to get from total seek. Um, and just for anyone clicks go, the point of this is that it's supposed to fail a little. It's okay. Let's save it actually so we can more easily look at it when we call it meta wide. And so it's still down here. And so this is the most common error. So there's no actual error, it runs, right? But this does not look right. The most common error when you do pivot wider. So we see that we get our two values, but they're still on two different rows. And then the opposite one is filled in with NA for missing. So this happens because it's assuming that every single other column should be exactly the same. And in our case, our library ID includes the condition. So we can't say that the library ID of patient one, we can't say which one of these libraries is correct. So this is not unique, which means that you just still end up with two rows. So when this happens and you try to pivot wider and you get all these NAs, it almost always means there's some row, or sorry, some column that is not the same for the two things you're trying to put on the same row. In our case, it's what I do. So we can fix this. We're going to remake meta wide and we're going to use our pipes. So we're going to take meta. Oh, also, I really never said this command shift M or control shift M is a pipe. So command shift M, which is how I've been typing a pipe so fast, I have to get the shortcut. So our one problem column is our library ID, and we don't actually need that to be able to tell our samples apart, right? Because it's just the patient ID, and then whether it's media or MTB, and those are already other columns. So we can use select and get rid of our library ID, which is our problem column. And then we pivot. Oh, You'll see here, I do have quite a few uh, paragraph breaks because my font is so large. Certainly many of these things can be on the same line and be very readable. So we take our meta, we remove a column from it. Now that not saved, but kind of saved data frame without that column is what gets used in pivot wire. Command shift M or control shift M. Remember, it saves right here what we just ran, but let's look at it. And now we have the correct. So not every patient has a single row. There's only 10 rows now. 10 rows here, there used to be 20. And every total seat says it's on phone. Now we know, because we made this right now, that these two columns are total seeks. But if someone got this data frame, they don't actually know that, right? There's just a column that says media. No idea what that number is. So because our original condition column didn't give us a beautiful name, we can take this and make it even better. So I'm just gonna copy it. Paste. And so some of these, like I said, some of these additional parameters in Pivot Wider and Feeder Pivot, let me open the help page. Well, so you can see there's a lot of options. Um, 
you know, we have these options for names. So like, do you sort them? Do you blue, which is has to do with an error? Do you separate? Do you add a prefix? Um, and so if we added that this was going to be total seeks to media or MTB, now we can tell what the data were. So we're going to continue this and give it a prefix. So I'm going to prefix here, quotations, because we're telling it a word that we just want to tack on to something. I'm going to use total seek. And so now our new columns, no matter how many columns, if we had seven different conditions and got seven new columns, now all of them are going to start with total seek. So now if someone gets this data frame, now they know exactly what it is. This is total seeks from media, total seeks from TV. There is, uh, at least not currently, a suffix adding. Uh, oh, there is, I think it asked for it on the home page. Uh, so the easiest thing is with the, the prefix. Can I get green for when you've successfully pivoted your table? <laughs> Not a lot of green checks. So if there's questions or errors, please let us know. What was the way to get it from 20 rows to 10 again? Because that's we're still I'm hung up on. So that's happening because of the pivot. So even before we rename things, that's what it's taking your 20 rows and slitting the double total seats across the two. Mm -hmm. So that's what pivot is doing. And then we can just see that it's changed. Size. Sorry for that, or is that like when I view, I have that typed in, but like when I go to view it, it still has the 20 rows and the, the NAs. Are you opening renaming it something else like meta wide and opening that one? Um, yeah, I'm opening that one. That's so funny. Yeah. Can you um, copy paste your exact code into the Slack? This is the easiest way to troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So now we're going to undo uh, pivot wider with pivot longer. We're going to create meta long, which is the same as meta. We're just renaming it so we can see it. Pivot longer, we're going to tell it where our names are going to go to now. They were column names from somewhere to column names. Now we're taking them from column names to a column. We're going to call it condition because that's what it was before. And similarly, we had values from. Now we want our values to go to a new column. And we had total peak, our original one. Uh, so these uh, are in quotations. I personally think in the tidyverse, they shouldn't be because it's the column name. But this is the case. Um, I believe the reasoning is because they don't actually exist in your data yet. So you need to put quotations to say, I want to name them this word. You know, they're going to very soon be a variable name, which then will not need quotations. One of my long-time tidyverse gripes. But we get an error. So unlike what we did with pivot wider, where the idea was we were taking all of our data minus the web ID we just took out uh, and pivoting it with pivot longer, it can't pivot longer the entire data frame or you'd end up with just a single column without any meaning. You still need to have your original columns. We only took our condition column and our total seeks and made it into two columns. Now we just want to tell it only take those two columns and put them back. Currently, we are getting an error because it's trying to take the entire data frame. So it's saying calls must select at least one column. We can't do the whole data frame. We can't do no part of the data frame. So we have to add in here. The actual first parameter is to give it your column names. So concatenate if you want multiple. You'll remember we've used the prefix. So I'm going to have to say, I want you to take these two columns. So take just these two columns and make them longer. Leave everything else the same, which in the case of making longer means it's going to copy paste all of those rows to be the same, which is what we had before, where you know we had PTID of one twice because there were two samples for it. So anything we don't tell it to pivot in this first statement just gets repeated and copy pasted. Uh, similar if you open up your table and sell or whatever, and you're when you're pivoting, you're usually doing a lot of copy pasting in this same way. Uh, this sort of statement is just like select. You can also do negative. You can say minus and only do everything except for this one column or these two columns or whatever. We'll run that, we can look at meta long, and we end up with basically the same data frame we had before. Um, some subtle differences because we used the prefix notation when we made it wider. Now that it's longer, that prefix still exists in our condition. So, you know, probably not what we would do in you know real data analysis, but fine for here. Additionally, you'll see just the column ordering when you pivot longer, the new the two columns the names and the values you're putting into go on the right side doesn't particularly matter unless you're trying to use this viewer screen and you're like the table's too large and they're off the screen but in our case we have a small enough to be the frame where you can see them Error question Percent. Oh, Jared. Did you read the missing Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. I just okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so whenever you're undoing pivot, you're not, you're not always undoing. Sometimes it's, you started somewhere and you want to make it longer. Uh, these need to exactly match whatever your column names uh, were in here. So for example, when we first made our data frame, it just said media and MTB is the column names, no total seeks prefix. So then it would have just been media and MTB 
which then when we made longer would actually then look exactly like the original data frame. So we don't have a prefix. Um, but it is very rare that you're gonna make something wider and then longer immediately after. So this sort of weird naming change um, wouldn't matter. But we can double check our meta long versus the dimensions of meta. I remember note I saved my years, which years thing. Um, so, oh, actually, no, that's not why this is different. So now they're the same number of rows. The difference is remember, we had to remove lib ID to have unique row identifiers. So now we have one fewer variable in our new meta long because we got rid of lib ID from the original one. That's fine in this case because we have first ID. Oh, they also might be one different if you didn't save age in years, okay. which I didn't. So this is actually, I don't think it's in the notes, but this is a perfect point to bring up of this sort of uh, renaming and overwriting and naming things different, not ideal, not great. And so the next thing we're going to do is take everything we've done and put it in a single piped statement. So then we don't have to worry about this anymore. So, scroll up in my notes so I remember everything we did. That we're not gonna do literally every single thing, but we're gonna do one example of everything all around. So, we're gonna take meta, we're gonna pipe. And so, in the beauty of this, so we're gonna call this meta clean, is because we're doing pipes, we're only gonna ever save this output data frame once. There's not gonna be meta one, meta two, meta, meta three, or meta filter, meta select, meta, all these different. Um, we'll have to remember whether, oh, did I save that years variable or did I not? The beauty of pipes is once you get your workflow in place, usually testing each step like we've done already, then you just have one huge statement. You run once, something goes wrong, you just rerun that one very long statement to get your data back to evaluate why. So we know that we're not going to need lib ID. So we're going to do a minus of selects, our example of selects. So we don't need those. Um, I'm making this up, so this might have an error. We're going to filter something. Let's only keep email participants. Why not? So that has to equal our email. We're going to rename and do the infection equals condition again. We did that one before. I know I'm typing extremely fast. That's toxic. Like I said, once when you're actually making a workflow, you know, it's very important, particularly as you're learning to like run just this part of the code, make sure the output is what you think, particularly with pivots, make sure and then move on. Um, but once you get more comfortable with tidyverse or you're doing you know, more routine things like select and filter being the most common, I just you know, write the two lines and then run them all at once because I trust that I'm not going to get an error. And sometimes I do. But name um we're not going to summarize because that's going to ruin our piping but we could put a summary in here mutate let's make that age years or age days eight years you know, this is the case where um, even I, I pivot all the time. I'm going to run all this. Importantly, with pipes, my cursor can be here. My cursor can be here. It can be up here. It can be down here. My cursor can be anywhere in the statement. And if I hit run, it runs the whole thing. If I want to run part of it, you have to then select just the part you want to run. I run all of it. Whenever doing pivots, like I said, I always run before, look at what it looks like, then run after because it changes a lot about the data. So these are the data as they stand. We have three patients, two samples from each, this new age and years column. And again, still the only thing that differentiates our two infection types in terms of these data is that total piece. And I can continue on. Our names from 
Uh, now we've called it infection. It's not called condition, condition anymore. Values of some sort of I will not bother with the prefix for now. It doesn't matter. Stop the line. And this final decimal data pin. So really that's just to show you put pipes and you kind of read what's happening. You know you're working on meta, you're selecting, you're filtering, you're renaming, you're mutating, you're pivoting. So you can read down the line. And now we wouldn't have to worry about like, oh, I'm missing one column because I didn't save that other one and you did. And so this would all match. So in theory, it should all match. We could then undo the pivot, but it's then. Yeah. So when you're talking about like renaming columns and all that, is it ever easier to just put back that additional column in Yes. So the question is, is it sometimes easier just to, you know, open it in Excel and change it? And the answer is yes, uh, particularly when some of the names have really have break R's rule, like they start with numbers or they have special characters um, or they're not in English. That's always fun um, when they're not in Unix coded letters. So sometimes, yes. Um, it really, the question always just comes down to how many times you're going to have to do that. Is it, is that really the final table? No one's going to touch it. No one's going to add to it. Yeah, you just go change it if they're particularly if they're really bad. But the more uh, that happens, often you'll get the same sort of file from somebody and have to do the same sort of renaming. So if you've already written the code, you could just run it again. Or if you think, oh no, I'm going to add a sample, I want you to go back. And so I like to think about if it, whatever's output by a machine in the lab, by the sequencer or by Close cytometer, I like to take exactly that and immediately put it into R because it's a pain to rename everything, but you only have to do it once in theory. That means that I have Excel on my computer and I open it a lot of days. <laughs> so. Another general question like, there isn't a, another pipe symbol like at the very end. From, I guess maybe if you've actually put them at the beginning of each of these states or can you explain when you're adding new ones? <laughs> yeah, so the pipe is whatever is to the left of the pipe gets put into what's the right. So we don't put one at the end. But I'll show you how. If you put one at the end, R actually sits here. It's still, it hasn't finished running the statement. So you don't see a new carrot. It's still the plus. It thinks you're going to, you've got to put this into something. Like what kind of, what else do you want me to do with it? Um, so we don't end with one. And just the way I write on lines of code, I end the line with it. So like, this is a complete function on its own, just selecting. And then that output gets typed into the next thing. So because I've saved it as an object, it gets saved then in our environment that I could put it. Oh, it's just classic thing. So once you are trapped, in a function, there's still a plus sign. Then whatever I print after, um, as a side note, to get out of that, I'm stuck. You hit escape, and then you get a new carrot. So that's what happened there. I, would, I technically typed the same thing twice. Uh, so if I didn't save it as anything, it just prints it to the console. What would happen if instead of the pipes, you just put commas at the end of every line? Yeah, I wouldn't know what to do. Types, uh, particularly this type of pipe is specific to tidyverse. There is a new base R pipe, because so many people ask for it, um, that works in tidyverse and works in base R and does the same thing. That's that other, I wrote it somewhere. Sorry, slash earlier, but they work exactly the same since we're in tidyverse, so we use the same form. When we get to ggplot, we'll see that they use a different symbol. Okay, on questions online? We're going to go back to declare again. 
doesn't really matter what package we're in, technically. So far, we've only worked with metadata, single data frame. Very rarely in our world do we only have one type of data. Uh, so now we're gonna work with some functions that involve joining together two data frames. Um, if you've ever, and I've done this, uh, been that person sitting with your two sheets open and then you copy paste them together and then look for lines that don't match and shift down you know, one line as you try to get them to line up. So all the samples, it's the worst. Um, R in a single line of code does that with zero errors and it's magic. Um, and I wanna go back to grad school and say this stuff <laughs> with like 300 microbiome groups. Anyway. Uh, so to do that, we need multiple data frames. So we're going to load the other data, which is that complex data object. We need to load data. Yeah. Oh no, not from the result. Yeah. Zoom. And um, so some background on these data. The way we process our data are through um, edge R and Lima, or the two R packages. And so in the end. You end up with this that object, which I named that. Similar to all of our other metadata tables, you can name it whatever you want. It has the targets, which is the exactly the same as the metadata file we've been working with. It also has E for expression data. So this is that counts table of each row is a gene. Each column is a library from sequencing. And then the values are how many sequences you found in that sample from that gene. Mm -hmm. So things we don't really care about are weights and design. Those are for linear modeling. We're not using them. And then additional genes, which just tells us more about our genes. We have ensemble IDs. We have Hugo symbols. You know, you can call genes by lots of different names, and it just matches it so that you can find them. Just to let you see a little bit more of it. Um, this is all base R because it's easier to do this real quick. If we just want to look at uh, that E, don't run this. It's huge. We're just going to ask for the first three columns and the first three rows. So this is what these data look like. We have our Hugo gene symbol, which is name, and then we have our different. These are the same as the lib ID, the library ID from our metadata. Um, these are log two counts per million, which is why they're not whole numbers and why sometimes they're negative. They're in log. And similarly, we can look at targets, which is just familiar. It's just the metadata from before with a couple of extra variables from the women normalization. So if we want to combine these and say, I want to be able to, you know, maybe your library IDs aren't patient and then conditioned. Maybe they're literally random strings of numbers like lib 074. I don't know what that means. Uh, often we want to take these two data frames, so all of our metadata and all of our count data here, and we want to put them together so that then I can plot, say, the expression of a gene in media versus MTB. Useful. If um, my library IDs didn't already tell me media and MTB, which they usually don't, um, I can't do that without merging these two tables. So our goal is to take this table here. We're gonna have to pivot it because we need the library IDs in their own columns so that we can match to our metadata. So first we pivot. So the goal of this is get match. So it's the expression data set, call it E for sure. We're going to make it long. It's currently wide. Every library has its own column. We want all of the library's names to be in one name column and all the expression to be one expression column. One caveat here, and this is very specific to data that comes out of Lemma, is the expression data frame is actually a matrix, not a data frame. So Fidiverse doesn't like it. It's not a tibble. Again, matrix, tibble, data frame for everything we're doing, it really doesn't matter, but we have to force it. We have to say, read this as a data frame. So that's just telling R and particularly the tidyverse to format it out of the hood correctly. Um, the only thing to be careful about when moving between data frames and matrices is matrices very often have row names. 
which we haven't seen before. So row names here, they're just numbers, slightly grayed area. Hedivers uh, hates them. Matrices often have them, which is why they're a matrix. But Hedivers has provided us a function to fix this. Uh, so first, let's just look at the function. Just run V1. If you have a, and this is a subset one, so you can anyone can this is not to do. So we see there, it's hard to see on the screen, but it's a little bit gray, meaning these are row names. We can double check that. You can ask for the row names. And we see it's all of these gene names. So we're going to move those because if we pivot or we do anything to this table and it still has row names, tidyverse hates them and assumes they don't exist. So it deletes them all. You have these nice row names, you pivot and they're just gone. Not great. So we're going to redo this part as data frame. Expression yeah. data. Right. So this is a new function, row names, and I never type it all out. There's row names to column, take my row names, put them in a column. There's also column to row names. Take a column of data, make them into row names. So while Tidyverse does not like row names and strongly suggests against them, you have functions to make and delete them as they recognize them. Um, we have to give it a name, which is called gene, it's the gene name. So if we were to look at that, we see now it's just, now we have row names or just numbers and we have a column gene with all of this information. So now we can't lose it. We're just gonna continue building. So remember our goal is we need those library IDs that are the different columns. We need to bring them into one column to be able to have a lib ID column to match our metadata. So we're going from wide to long. We're gonna pivot longer. Remember with pivot longer, if you don't tell, you have to tell it which columns you want to pivot, um, you, or else it won't use any, or it'll try to use all. It doesn't work. This is one of those cases where I don't want to write twenty library IDs, so I can simply just say do everything except for the gene column. Keep the gene column. Copy paste it as many times as you need as you create more rows. And we're going to take our names, which these are those column names, are the same as lib ID. And all the data, one, all the data values to log the cats per million, please. I usually just call this E, but then I was realizing I was typing E, dollar sign E, it looks weird. So we're going to call it actually the units that it is. So again, the real goal of this is to get that lib ID because we need, in order to merge our two data frames, we need to tell our column or more than one column that they share to match them on. When we run this, we see we get the longest possible version of the data frame of we have each gene has 20 rows where it's the expression of, uh, of that gene in each library. So, you know, this is very different than E versus Um, and because we've pulled it out here as a single data frame, we no longer have to use the dollar sign. It's not part of that. It doesn't know that existed. It's its own data frame now. So, you know, we used to have 13,000 some odd genes in our 20 libraries. Now they're all super long. Uh, 260 Now, if we think about yeah. and just look at the first a little bit versus our stats target. The first zero of the gun. So now we have these two data frames, but we have this column exactly matches its values to this column. And because I did pivoting, I could name them the same thing. So I know. So now we can join them. I'm gonna open the notes real fast. There's a visual in here that's very helpful. 
there are lots of different join options. So these are the most used ones. It comes down to what happens when you have a library in one data frame that does not exist in the other data frame. Inner join means that you delete that. In order for a library to be kept, it has to have both expression data and metadata. In this case, if it doesn't, the whole row gets removed. There's left join and right join, which have to do with just what's on the left and what's on the right of the function, which data frame do you get first? And so if you're on the left join, it means if it exists, if that row exists and whatever you put first on the left, keep it. Fill in NAs wherever you need to because it's missing in the other one, but keep it no matter what. Right is the opposite. This and the second data frame you give it, the right one, keep it no matter what, and then fill in NAs for all the left stuff that you don't have. Full join is both of those together. Anything that exists in either data frame, keep it and then fill in the corresponding NAs. For me, at least, inner join and full join are the ones I basically use. Inner join being if something's missing, I don't care about it, get rid of it. If I don't have metadata on it, I can't plot it, so I don't care. Or full join, meaning I'm terrified of losing any data. I'd rather know that it's missing. So it's important that it doesn't tell you when it's deleting rows. You just have to look and see that it's deleted rows. So full join's nice because you get all these NAs and you say, why is this entire row NA? Oh, it's because it was missing in the left to the right. Similar to pivot, it's just doing these and then looking at the outcome to make sure it did what you think it did. So in our case, we're lucky enough that every single library with expression data has metadata. So whether you use inner left, right, or full, they will be exactly the same. So it doesn't matter. But just to be super sure, because in our case, if we want to plot expression versus condition, we need both expression and condition. So we're going to do inner because if there were anything missing, we wouldn't be able to plot it. We're going to give it the beautiful name of full data and inner join. And again, this is where left and right come in. So left is just the first one. Um, so we want meta, or actually it's probably the same data object. We want the you know, targets data frame. And we want that long version of our expression data. Again. When we run it, we see we haven't told it what to join by. So when you have two columns that are named exactly the same thing in the two data frames, you don't have to tell. It gives you a nice little message saying, I found libid in both of your data frames. Therefore, I'm going to match libid. You can also make it do that. So I just I copy this. That parameter can actually be set, which it gives you the code right there. If I Now you don't get that message because you've told it. If for some reason you did not have two beautifully named um, data frame columns that were the same, so I'm not going to run this because it's going to be a little run. What you can do is list, uh, so left name, right. So if for some reason in targets, it was called to say library ID, and in my long version, it was called lib ID, library ID and lib ID are not identical, R cannot match them. So I could say library ID equals lib ID. I will then be able to match them. You can also list multiple things. In our case, we only have one matching column. If you had multiple things, like we wanted to match on the library ID is patient ID and condition. Let's say we have both of those columns in both data frames, you would just again concatenate list all the columns. Um, I very much like to just do designs like this, where I've set up the data frames where I know they have exactly the same variable names that I want to join by. And then it's a nice check when I get this message, I know what it should say. I know what I should be joining by. So if it doesn't list all the variables I thought I was joining by, I know I have an error or an issue of some kind. So we see we have the same number of rows as our E long, which means that doing inner join did not delete any rows. So that's like an important check to know that everything existed in both, I didn't lose anything. But it wouldn't have told me if I had, I just had to look. And we see 
all of our metadata, so all the way through yeah. here, the sample weights, and then now we've tacked on to the end the gene and then the expression matched for every single library. Now this library for this gene, there's its expression. This is a bit of you know, kind of wasted RAM usage in the sense that I've just copy pasted the metadata table like 13,000 times. Um, so when you're dealing with really, really large data, this can get too big to work with. Um, but in terms of plotting, it's the easiest way to get everything together. If you were having RAM issues, if it was slowing down, the easiest thing to do is when you're making e long, only filter to the genes you care about first. So I would add into here. Before I would pivot, I would say filter gene in list of the genes I care about, and then pivot it, and then it would be much, much smaller. In the case of this, I think most of the laptops, everyone has a Mac in here, so you can certainly do it. But even um, our high school students' uh, Windows machine that's 10 years old can do most of these. So just as a note, if you have slowness, filter at this point. Ooh. Filter at this point, so you don't keep all the 13,000 genes. In the note, there's a link to um, a nice, so this shows examples of what happens with every single type of join. Um, it is how I learned joins out of this web course, um, their web instructions. This is a nice resource to, um, I didn't even go over like send and join, never use it. It's a thing. Left, right, anti, also never use, um, and you can see what exists and what gets deleted and where enemies get added. Okay. With that, the next set of exercises. So two exercises, we're gonna again break, work on them, and then come back and go over them. And also back and break, slash get up, slash move around. Um, and let's do 15 minutes, so 3.30. So with the exercises, um, they're thought exercises, then you check in code, right? Uh, the easiest way to figure out what a pivot or a join is doing is to run it. Um, so that's what we're going to do. So the first one is talking about, so let's get our metadata so the targets or meta, they're the same, uh, to just our media samples and then thinking about inner join. So if you remember inner join means it has to be inside of both of them. It has to be in the inside part of event or So anything that doesn't exist gets deleted in this case. So the thought experiment is supposed to be well, then I should get half as many rows because half of the samples were MTB, half the media. So if I just have the media, inner only keeps the media, and we get that. So we can do that by we take our targets or meta, same data frame. We're going, like, oh, that's the keyboard shortcut for closing R that I never remember how to do except by accident. I'm not even kidding. I don't know what my fingers are. We're going to filter. Condition. This is still the original version, so it's called condition, not infection. Yeah. I just have a quick question. Yeah. I'm just a little bit confused by why that targets. Uh, that's just because of. In order to simplify things and work with just one data frame to start, I saved that targets as a CSV file and then we used it. Oh. So yeah, in the actual scheme of things, we would never have had meta. It just is part of targets. So I guess I kind of, this is more intro, so like to back up about it. This data type 
is a list of multiple data frames all together so that they are matched. And when you do versions and you do filtering, it applies to all of the different pieces at the same time um, inside of this Glimmer universe of data analysis. And so targets is just what they call the metadata file that we originally gave them. Um, no, you absolutely, in this case, since we loaded meta from a CSV file, it's the same data. So you could use meta here, absolutely. Yeah. So filter to media. Um, so this is a nice trick. So I want to make sure that this is working. So I'm just going to end my pipe with n row. And you tell me I have my 10 rows, which is what I'm expecting. Um, so it's just a oh, okay check. That's what I think it is. Now I can continue my pipe. I'm going to inner join. I currently remember here left and right matter. And so in the case of a pipe, the left is whatever the output of my pipe is doing. So I don't have to put metadata or dot targets or anything. It's going to take my media filtered metadata and use that as the first data frame. And then we give it the second data frame. It's clear. We're gonna... All of these little pull data or media data. So if we compare pull data, Media data. The half the rows is only half the simple. Importantly, there's no new NAs. If our metadata or our expression data had had NAs to start, that's fine. Those would still be there. There aren't any in this case. So nothing gets filled in. Um, and we can quickly ask that. So a table is just, you know, just a base R. Is anything NA inside of uh, media data? Take a second because it's looking at thousands of rows. Uh, it says false. Everything's false. There are no new NAs. There were no NAs to start. Nothing, you know, was added. In this case, rows of expression data. So all of the expression data from our MTB samples was just deleted because it had no need to be there with an inner join. So there's no message about it. There's nothing. It's just you are now gone because we didn't have any metadata and we asked for an inner join. This is in contrast, so the direct comparison is with full joints. I'm just going to copy all the same jump code and do full join. All media data two, so that we know it's different. Not a great name, but you know, we're, we're just working on exercises here. Done that compared to our full data and our two. Quick summary of we got the NAs in there, any missing data. So, in this case, because full join um, was the full data, they should be the same size because anything missing in our metadata should get filled in with NAs when there's a corresponding expression. Thankfully, they are the exact same size. And the reason, and we'll look at it as well, the reason is because there's a ton of NA. Scroll up so you can see that code. Look at it. Here's our media data too. We have our media sample. All the media samples. We can scroll for a while. Scroll all the way to the end. We see things like this. So these the samples have a library ID, a gene, and there's that gene expression from our expression data, but we didn't have any metadata because we deleted it, filtered it, should say. And so it just all gets filled in with NAs. So every sample that existed because it's full gets a row 
is just got a bunch of enemies because we don't have this information. Um, this is why full join can be really helpful when you don't know if you have missing samples. You do a join, you know, maybe not on a 200 and some odd thousand uh, cell data frame, but on smaller data frames, you can then look and see, okay, well, if there's rows of NA, that means there's something missing. And you can double check, is that really a missing sample? Is it because my library ID has a typo in it? So it doesn't match when I think it should. Um, and those are a bit of data wrangling that does take a bit of little work, like by hand, looking at it, figuring out what's wrong with your specific data. 